Hello and welcome back to GYC. We're bringing you live coverage here from Houston, Texas. And today, like we mentioned earlier this morning, is a huge day at GYC because it's Outreach Day. My name is Greg Morconi. I'm here with Tim Parton. Right. It's such a privilege to be here. We're excited. There's a great sense of excitement oh, in the air. There is. From, from the outreach that they have done today, you've talked about the buzz that's going on tonight. Oh, yeah, it's incredible. So, yeah, yeah tell us you know, some details. Well, yeah, we've heard. They're tr still trying to figure out all the statistics, but they sent out over 32 buses. We don't know yet how many Bible studies were passed out, how many sure. doors were knocked on, but I know it was a lot. You know, Tim, we were talking about the buzz, because as we're waiting to go live here, the young people are streaming in, right. and you can just hear like this murmur throughout the auditorium. And what it is is that people are discussing their experiences of knocking on doors. They don't even know who these people are. That can be right. kind of scary. Yeah, as we all know, the evangelism is, a, is yeah. a scary thing to to reach out to people who we don't know. But it's exciting to know that behind the doors of in those neighborhoods are people that have mm. really literally come to an end wow. to themselves and of their own ability to change their lives. Yeah. And so we are called to go to the end of the earth. Amen. But that means to the end of your neighborhood, the end of your street, to the end maybe even of your hallway. That's a good um, point. Just to reach out to people, someone who needs to hear the great message that Jesus Christ loves them and can save them. And so again, like we mentioned this morning, pray for the doors that have been knocked on because now Amen. people are making decisions. Do I want to study the Bible? Do I not? They have a piece of literature. Do I want to read it or not? So pray for the people that the doors have been knocked on here in the Houston area. Definitely. Tim, this is your first GYC. This Give me a little bit of your thought, your flavor of what you've thought about GYC. Well, it's just, I remember going to youth conferences and, and rallies when I was a kid, a teenager. Yeah, sure. But this is like, this is on steroids. <laughs> this is really amazing to me. Good it's, description. It's fun, fun to watch this. And tonight is going to be no exception to sure. see all the youth back in the booths at the exhibit hall. Yes. And um, to know that this is this is what their their life the, the year has come to this the end yeah. of the year they have all anticipated this time yeah they so have exciting. and they're so enthusiastic so excited Absolutely. about studying the word of god for sure oh yeah tonight we're again going to be blessed with uh, pastor steve conway bringing right. the uh, message this evening of course you can hear the music going on behind us it's always a blessing to hear god's word Amen. open and Amen. uh and presented yeah. so you hear the music like we mentioned let's yeah. join gyc here on the stage thank you again for joining us for 3 abn Next song will be number 367, Rescue the Perishing.
let's all rise for our opening song, our theme song, This Witness I Will Bear. Good evening, GYC. How many of you are feeling blessed right now? Amen. How many of you enjoyed outreach? Amen. I love to see all those smiling faces and those hands raised. We're so happy to have you back here again with us tonight, and we're excited about what God has to share through our speakers. And so I just wanted to welcome all of you, give you a warm welcome, and I'm going to let our president share a few words. All right. Well, I hope you've had a blessed day going on outreach, and God has been good in giving you divine appointments as well. Well, today, tonight, we have a very special program, and we also have a very special guest who will be sharing some very important words with us. His name is Elder Ted Wilson. He is the president of our church, and he is one who loves the young people. And he took time off of his schedule so that he could come here to GYC and share some words of wisdom with us. Before he takes the stage and addresses us, we want to have a word of prayer together. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity 
of being alive today. We thank you that we can be Seventh-day Adventists and believe in a sure message and a sure, sure Savior who will be coming very soon. Please be with us, Lord, and bless Elder Wilson as he addresses us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What a, priv what a privilege it is to be with GYC this year. I want to thank all of you for the tremendous effort you've made in reaching out to the people of Houston. For those of you who went out today with the outreach, praise God for what you were able to do in touching the lives of many, many people. You are truly GYC workers for God. And I want to thank you for that in a very, very special way. And thank Pastor Moise Ratsara and his team for the tremendous work that GYC is doing. And what a privilege it is to be here with the theme, To the End. To the end of time, to the ends of the earth an opportunity for you to focus on what that marvelous verse in Acts chapter 1, verse 8 points out, that the Holy Spirit will give power not only to those who are waiting at that time, but power to you and to me because we are living in the very, very end of time. We are humbly placing ourselves before the Lord as his waiting disciples were at that time. The mission is ahead of us. And I believe with all my heart that we are headed into the very last end of time setting and that Christ's return is imminent. That's why we need to proclaim his word, his righteousness, his sanctuary service, his saving power in the great controversy, his three angels' messages, his health message, his last day mission to the world, including the need to plead for the latter reign of the Holy Spirit. I want to encourage each of you in your small groups and in your areas where you're staying to pray for the latter reign of the Holy Spirit and to fix your goals upon only that which heaven will bless. It was a privilege for me to spend a little time with the Activate uh, GYC just before this. Each of us has, we have goals, we have a mission in store for us. Let's make sure that it's in line with what the Lord wants. And let's proclaim Christ's soon second coming. I want to personally thank each of you in GYC for your very strong support of God's worldwide church and its mission to prepare people through the Holy Spirit's power for Christ's second advent. And I'm very grateful for your commitment and for your very humble support of God's great church. I want to tell you tonight that I am of very good courage in the Lord. I hope you are as well. And I want to thank you for your prayers and how you have supported God's church and will do so in the future. I want to share tonight just a few aspects that I shared at our recent annual council in Battle Creek. Some poignant information that I want you to take as a personal message as we move forward to the end under the blessing of heaven. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verses 23, 24, and 25, it tells us here, and Paul is speaking, I believe that Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. In verses 23, 24, and 25, it says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, 
and so much the more as you see the day approaching. And I want to tell you, GYC, the day is approaching when the Lord will come in all of his glory. What an opportunity for GYC to be involved in this tremendous outreach to the world. The Lord has been leading his people, and he is about to accomplish the final work through them to proclaim the three angels' messages and the fourth angel of Revelation 18, calling people out of confusion and into full Bible truth. You see, the three angels' messages have at the very core of those messages the righteousness of Jesus Christ and turning people back to the true worship of God. GYC, I want you to remember how God has led this movement, not only the Advent movement, but the GYC movement in the past, and gain from that confidence that God will do the same in the future. We're reminded of that wonderful promise in Life Sketches, page 196, where it says that we have nothing to fear for the future except that we forget how God has led us and his teaching in our past history. Don't ever forget how God has led us. Today's society is so full of influences that seek to derail and destabilize each of us from heaven's entrusted mission to this Seventh-day Adventist church, this prophetic movement. Now, many of those in the church are at crossroads, a crossroad. Will they focus upon Christ, upon his word, upon the instruction in the spirit of prophecy, on his mission, or will they focus on worldly influences that are creeping into so many aspects of the church today? theological aspects, lifestyle aspects, societal aspects, mission, prophetic understanding, pride and self-centeredness, which seems to be creeping in to our very church. I want to tell you, God has his standards so that as you reach to the end, of this time to the end of the world, God has his standards. The standards are found in his holy word. The standards are found in the beautiful life of Jesus Christ and how he lived it. The standards are found in the instruction of the spirit of prophecy. Eternal standards are not set by human beings. They're not set by leaders by pastors, by teachers, by others. These standards are set by God himself. And I want to thank you for your faithfulness to the standards that God has placed before you. You are not alone. Many others are with you. God is with you to the end. Now let's hold fast that confession that Paul was emphasizing in the 10th chapter of the book of Hebrews. Hold fast that confession and we will face many obstacles and challenges in the way, the antagonism that people will throw at us. But let's hold fast to God's truth, his word, his love for his church. This church will not fail. This church will not fall apart. God's church, of which GYC is a vital part, will go through to the end. I know that God is going to guide you in this. I urge you, GYC, to plead for the latter reign of the Holy Spirit as you see the world around us disintegrating. God will pour out his spirit on all those who are humbly receptive and conform their lives to his will express, expressed in his holy word and the instructions 
of the, of the wonderful spirit of prophecy. Let me share a few important points with you that I shared at the annual council. GYC, first of all, stand firm for the biblical truth that the Godhead is constituted by three divine and equal persons from eternity to eternity. There are those who proclaim some aberrant and confusing anti-Trinitarian heresy. Our pioneers faced that, and they were led to a right understanding by the scriptures and the guidance of Ellen White's instructions. Hold fast and stand firm for God's truth to the end. He is with you. Secondly, young people, there may be some who introduce worldliness into personal dress, into lifestyle, into conduct, in church life and activities. I urge you to stand firm for God's simple truth and lifestyle to the end. Thirdly, as you engage in reaching the community with God's message, always make sure that your efforts and outreach are in complete accordance with the gospel message and biblical instruction, since certain worldly activities and trends are not according to the instruction of the Bible and can lead you away from the central focus, which is to present Christ crucified risen, interceding, and soon to return to take us home. Do not allow anything to overshadow God's last day message. Stand firm for God's truth to the end. Number four, you may also face those who attempt to neutralize Sabbath observance and biblical creation. GYC, thank you for standing firm for God's word and his truth to the end that the earth was created in six literal days recently with the Sabbath as God's creation memorial. Let us remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Number five, some of you may encounter those who show contempt for anyone wanting to live a simple, health, healthy, plant-based non-alcoholic, non-caffeine lifestyle, according to the biblical and spirit of prophecy counsel. Young people, stand firm for God's truth to the end. Number six, GYC, some in your local church may manifest a strange independence of spirit leading to disunity, but these challenges that you face in God's church around the world can be resisted by God's power in you to prevail in presenting God's word. Cling to God's word to the end. Young people, there are influences outside and within the church attempting to change God's institution of biblical marriage between one man and one woman. Stand firm for God's word to the end as it confirms biblical marriage, biblical human sexuality, and the biblical family as instituted by God himself. Number eight, there may be those in your local church who show a lack of spiritual respect for church authority. GYC, be of good courage and stand firm for God's truth and his church authority to the end. Number nine, you may, need some, you may meet some who share disparaging remarks and disinterest in the spirit of prophecy. My young friends, the spirit of prophecy is one of God's greatest gifts to his last day remnant church. Continue to stand firm for God's spirit of prophecy truth to the end. Number 10. There may be those who promote unscriptural and unsound methods of church growth, revealing a distrust for God's word and the inspired counsel. Hold fast to God's word and his correct methods of church growth and both personal and public evangelism to the end. Number 11, some discard the unique role of God's Advent movement 
in favor of ecumenical activity. Avoid ecumenical compromises and stand firm for God's unique, peculiar truth to the end. Number 12, in some regions of the world, we do have people who are facing intense persecution. Please pray for them and personally stand firm where you are for God's precious truth and for religious liberty to the end. Number 13, some in our church attempt to downplay, distort, or even destroy Christ's provision of righteousness by faith by denying his justifying and sanctifying power. However, God's instruction in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 and 13 remains relevant to this day. And it says there, Paul is speaking, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Now let's be sure to understand. It is Christ's righteousness both justifying and sanctifying righteousness that works in us as we humbly submit to him in daily prayer and Bible study. We are saved by God's grace through faith alone. Now in that beautiful book, Christ's Object Lessons, page 69, we read this quotation. Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. Now, Christ will reproduce in us his character as we daily surrender our will to him. God intends for his remnant people to rely completely on Christ, his righteousness, and his ability to save to the uttermost through his justifying and sanctifying process, all through his righteousness, not ours. Ellen White indicated in Review and Herald, March 10, 1903, righteousness within is testified to by righteousness without. He who is righteous within is not hard-hearted and unsympathetic, but day by day he grows into the image of Christ, going on from strength to strength. He who is being sanctified by the truth will be self-controlled and will follow in the footsteps of Christ until grace is lost in glory. The righteousness by which we are justified is imputed. The righteousness by which we are sanctified is imparted. The first is our title to heaven, the set second is our fitness for heaven." End quote. What a privilege to have the assurance of God's power in our lives. GYC, stand firm for God's truth and his righteousness to the end of time. Number 14, there may be those who de-emphasize the distinctive Christ-centered doctrines of the Bible criticizing God's prophetic timetable, including the pivotal ending of the 2300-day prophecy in 1844. However, GYC positively proclaim biblical and prophetic truth, stay the course to the end, preach the word in season and out of season. Young friends, Number 15, there are those who collapse under the complications of daily life without allowing God to lead. They are turned away from our final mission by the distractions of the world. However, stand firm for God's truth and look to Jesus in your daily life's activities to the end. Number 16, make sure that you live and worship in the context of worship shown in Revelation chapter 14 in the throne room of heaven, giving glory to God and him alone to the end. Number 17, GYC, 
There are those who discourage and in some instances even forbid the wide circulation and distribution of heaven-inspired books like The Great Controversy. Thank you for what you are doing in GYC to distribute truth-filled literature as you did today. Ellen White declared that The Great Controversy was to be distributed more than any other book that she ever produced. GYC stand firm for the distribution of truth-filled literature to the end. And finally, number 18. Young friends, there are those who disparage our hopeful expectation to be the last generation before Christ's soon coming. I ask, who wouldn't want to be part of the last generation and see Jesus come in their lifetime? What a privilege to realize that Christ wants to come back as soon as possible and we can be ready for his coming and share this hope through complete dependence upon Christ. Our works will not save us, but dependence on Christ and his justifying and sanctifying righteousness will save us and make us more and more like him every day. We are united in our hope of Christ's soon return. Stand firm for God's truth to the end. We have been called to a unique place in history as the Seventh-day Adventist Church. God intends that his church move forward on the pathway to the eternal city that will soon be given to each of us by Christ himself. Difficult days lie ahead for God's remnant as the devil throws everything he can against the forward advance of God's Advent movement. We know that the Omega, the great deception, is coming, which will test all church members to rely completely on God to avoid great and overwhelming deception. Now, just before I close, I want to share just a few additional quotations from this marvelous book called Christian Service. I've been very impressed by what I've been reading recently. It says here in page 38, the distance is widening between Christ and his people and lessening between them and the world. The marks of distinction between Christ's professed people and the world have almost disappeared. Is that the case in your life and in mine? I read from page, uh, here, page uh, 51. Satan sees that his time is short. He has set all his agencies at work that men may be deceived, deluded, occupied, and entranced until the day of probation shall be ended and the door of mercy forever shut. You see what the devil is trying to do to all of us in the church? He's trying to deceive, delude, occupy, entrance. Keep your eyes focused upon Christ and his mission to the end. Transgression has almost reached its limit. Confusion fills the world, and a great terror is soon to come upon human beings. The end is very near. Who, we who know the truth, should be preparing for what is soon to break upon the world as an overwhelming surprise. And in conclusion, let me read a few more very salient points. Satan is now seeking to hold God's people in a state of inactivity, to keep them from acting their part in spreading the truth, that they may at last be weighed in the balance and found wanting. But then this assurance. God's faithful messengers, page 56, are to go steadily forward with their work, clothed with the panoply of heaven. They are to advance fearlessly and victoriously, never ceasing their warfare until every soul within their reach shall have received the message of truth for this time. My dear friends here at GYC, I urge you, to stay on God's precious path, leading towards heaven itself. 
Let's stop looking to each other. Let's stop looking to outside experts. Let's stop looking to worldly influences and contemporary business practices. Let's stop looking to errant theological thinking. Let's stop looking to humanly devised church growth methods. And let's turn our eyes upon Jesus. Jesus is the true leader of this great Advent movement. And he is the only one that can guide us safely to our heavenly home, to the end. He is coming soon. Keep your eyes upon him as you do your work through the Holy Spirit's power to the end. I want to thank you, GYC, for what you are doing for God's great Advent movement. He will bless you during this coming new year of 2019 until the end as you focus your attention on what he has in store for you to contribute in reaching God's great and wonderful plan of taking this gospel to every corner of the world, to the ends of the earth. Now I want you to listen to those who are going to follow, who are going to be sharing with you about mission to the cities, comprehensive health ministry, all to the glory of God because it is part of God's great plan. Brothers and sisters in GYC, stand firm for God's truth to the end. Maranatha. Thank you so much, Elder Wilson, for that challenging and inspiring message. Good evening, GYC. Truly, Jesus is coming soon. Amen? Amen. And God needs each one of us to be a part of his mission to reach the world for Christ. And Amen. Dr. McKee, uh, as the assistant to Elder Wilson for total member involvement and as president of Adventist World Radio, you had a special burden for bringing together lay people, pastors, and physicians and healthcare providers for a, for a ministry. We've what had, what was that idea? We've seen wonderful things happen. Uh, Chitun Guiza, Dr. Landless, and also in in uh, in Texas, right right here in Texas, over at at uh, San Antonio, six new churches there because of comprehensive and health evangelism. Your best pathway to health. Your best pathway to health there. It's exciting to see what is happening. Mrs. White says that the worst evil can, that can come on the church is when doctors and pastors mm. don't work together. Can you imagine that? Over in the Philippines, and high in the mountains, communist held rebels for 50 years had tried to overthrow the government. The last two years we had no churches there. Now there are 92 villages that were, want to become Seventh-day Adventists. I just recently baptized five general rebel communists Amen. who are Amen. laid down Amen. their AK-47s and picked up a Bible. Awesome. And part of the way we reached them, Dr. McKee, was through Comprehensive, Comprehensive Health Ministry Health Events. and the radio through That's Adventist right. World Radio. That's right. So next to you is a very yes. special person. Amen. This is Dr. Peter Landless. He is our World Health Ministries Director for the General Conference. Now, Dr. Landless, I've heard you throw this term around a little bit. It's called Comprehensive Health Ministry. How does this relate to AWR and to all of these young people who are sitting out here today? Well, I'm so excited that it is here and at this forum yeah. that has been talked about. Amen. Comprehensive health ministry means health as a commodity being used by every ministry. And Brother Duane, thank you for grabbing hold of that. Amen and wanting to collaborate, to partner, and to bring this amazing opportunity together. And why at GYC? Because these are the troops who are going to take this yeah. message until Jesus comes. Amen. Amen. Not tomorrow, today. Amen. Amen. And um, it's, it's of such vital importance that we, that we lay hold of this, that we collaborate, Right. that we do as Jesus instructed us to do. In Matthew 9, we are told, he went through the villages and he was filled with compassion mm. because the people were harassed yeah. like sheep without a shepherd. Right. And then Ellen White gave this church, or the Lord gave this church through her, a message of comprehensive health 
ministry Amen. Amen. of reaching people where they are and what a privilege it is for us to do it as partners, partners together, together right. not only AWR, but General Conference Health Ministries, Amen. Your Best Pathway to Health. And as we work together, more will be Amen. done. Amen. So really what this is about is every part of the church should be using health ministry as a part of what they do. Well, at, actually, the blueprint states yeah. that every member wow. should be a comprehensive health worker, sharing health, health, and wholeness to all. Amen. Amen. So that is our opportunity. Every church, yeah. a center of hope and healing. Amen. So I think Amen. that includes all of you. Amen. Amen. So are you Amen. all health evangelists? Amen. I think so. I think so. All right, Dr. Leela. Yes. Now sir. you're a medical doctor. I am. I'm the only non-doctor on the stage, so I, I feel a little bit. <laughs> we, out of place we, here, we're praying for you. Thank you. Keep <laughs> praying for me, um, Dr. Leela. I understand uh, that. Well, actually, you and I were together this last summer. Just a few months ago. In Palawan, Philippines, where we had our first AWR Mega Medical Clinic. Tell us what happened. You know, it was phenomenal, Pastor Kyle. Yes, by God's grace, we saw 10,000 patients with a Gideon wait, wait, army. How many? 10,000. 10,000. With a Gideon army of only 300 wow. volunteers. Wow. 300? But that's, that was pretty exciting. But the Praise most God. exciting thing to me, Pastor Kyle, was the opportunity that we had to actually present the gospel every day to the patients. And on that third day, when over 2,000 people raised their hand, giving their hearts to Jesus, that was the most exciting thing I have ever experienced. And, and, and not only did they raise their hands, we then invited them to come to the total member involvement AWR and evangelistic meetings. so many meetings. of them Amen. came. Amen. Remember, Pastor yes. Carl, so many of them came. Thousands came, and we had over 500 baptisms as Amen. a result. Amen. Very That's why exciting. Dr. Lill is now our Adventist World Radio Medical Director. Amen. So, so Dr. Leela, as the new AWR medical director, we're planning something special because Palawan was last summer, but we've got something coming up just around the corner in India in 2019. What's I am happening? I'm so excited to tell GYC that Chennai, India, the main hub for the right. total member involvement event this summer, June 4 to 6, we, by God's grace, are going to service thousands upon thousands Amen. of patients Amen. with free Amen. medical, dental, eye care, and surgical wow. services. Wow. So, so this is going to happen right before the TMI meetings. And there's going to be, Dr. McKee, how many meetings in India this summer? How many? 4,000. Four th wow. wow. Praise wow. God. 4,000. So, so Amen. this summer, from June 4 to 6, we'll have the clinic right before the meetings. Who can be involved? I mean, do I have to be a doctor? Do I have to be a nurse? Somebody that knows AWR health AWR mobile clinics. Do not, yes, of course, we need medical providers and dental providers, but we need everyone. Everyone, electricians, plumbers, every single person has How a How about role. young people? Do you need young people? We Amen. desperately, especially need young people. In fact, Amen. what we say is if you have a smile and you have a heartbeat, you are needed. Okay, do you, can you guys smile? Can you look? <laughs> Dwayne, do you think they can yep, smile? Yep. Sure, they can. they can. I see it, yes. And I think they have Amen. heart beats. I think yeah. they can come. I think All right. so. So that's why tonight at the AWR booth, we are so committed because we want young people to come. Dr. McKee, what are we going to do for those? We're going come? to give 10 scholarships away. Is that right? That's right. $500 each. $500 each for those who will be selecting from those who come tonight to sign up to be a part of this exciting health outreach uh, for AWR and the TMI initiative this summer. Amen. We're excited. Now, Dr. Leela, it reminds me of a story from this summer because, you know, stories help us understand what happened. We had a man who came to our clinic in the Philippines. His name was June. He had been paralyzed from birth. Wow. But someone gave him a radio. Yeah. He was listening to AWR, got invited to come to the Mega Medical Clinic, brought his whole family. Man. And for the wow. first time, he got seen by a doctor, got his first wheelchair. Wow. But not only did, did that happen, he accepted Christ when we made the appeal, Amen. came to the evangelistic meetings. His whole family was baptized. Amen. They carried him into the ocean, wow. just like that paralytic brought Amen. to Jesus. Amen. And he was baptized and is a Amen. Seventh-day Adventist today. That is what comprehensive health ministry is all about, Amen. leading people from broadcast, health ministry to baptism, leading them to Jesus. Amen. Amen. So, Dr. Leela, if... There are young people here that want to get involved. They want to be a part of this ministry going forward. What do they need to do? Well, I would say if you want to have an absolutely life-changing experience, not just for this life, but for eternal life, 
get involved in comprehensive health evangelism. Amen. It will change your life. Right. What Pastor Wilson said tonight, as you draw closer and closer to Jesus, when you are involved with comprehensive health ministry, you Amen. will draw closer to Jesus. Amen. I just cannot implore you enough. Try it out. Come talk to us tonight. Come by our AWR booth, or if you're watching online or you want to connect with us on our Facebook page, yeah. message us on Facebook. Right. We'll have someone get back to you tonight. Tell us you're interested in going on a mission trip in the future or getting involved in your local church. We want to help you be a comprehensive health evangelist. Amen. Jesus is coming. He needs Amen. each one of us Amen. to help do our part that's so a, that he will come. That's an AWR, comprehensive health evangelist. Amen. 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 God bless you all. Amen. Good evening, GYC. My name is Jill Morricone. I'm the general manager of 3ABN. And for the past, I don't know, 12 plus years, 3ABN has had the privilege of broadcasting the GYC convention. We love the mission and the message of GYC. What a privilege it is to partner together. Just last night at the booth, I met a young woman who's all the way from South Africa. She said, I watched GYC for years on 3ABN, and it's my first time. And I got to come to the conference, and she was so excited. So we love GYC and the connection here. Romans 10, 14, Paul says, how shall they hear? Let me start that over again. How shall they know the gospel if they never heard it? And how shall they hear without a preacher. That's where the ministry of 3ABN comes in. Over 34 years ago, now just being honest with you, I was a very little girl 34 years ago, and most of you were probably not even born. But 34 years ago, God called Danny Shelton to build a television station that would reach the world with the undiluted three angels' messages, one that would counteract the counterfeit. And for all those years, we have sought to remain true to that mission. Currently, our 3ABN leadership team is looking at fresh and relevant ways that we can share the same message, but with new methods. I'm standing next to Jay, Jason Bradley, general manager of our Dare to Dream Network, which is our urban network, and tell us about some of those new ways, Jay. Well, you know, when you're sharing the gospel, accessibility is crucial. You have to be accessible. So if you pull out your phones, your, your tablets, your iPads, we have an app, a free app that you can download. It's the 3ABN app. So you just go to your Play Store or your App Store and type in 3ABN and get that app. You can also go to the website, 3ABN.tv, and actually watch the programming on there. We're on Roku. You just add the free 3ABN channel there. Um, we're on YouTube. You can go to youtube.com forward slash 3ABN. You know, it's, it's interesting how God blesses faithfulness. And so when you look at 3ABN, some of you might not know that there's so many more networks in addition. It's like 3ABN is the parent network, and then out of the parent network, you have 3ABN Latino. They have a YouTube channel as well, uh, youtube.com forward slash 3ABN Latino. Uh, Dare to Dream has a YouTube channel youtube.com forward slash d2d network tv so there, there's so many ways that you can watch the content um, at dare to dream what we like to do is we we target inner city residents we have a burden for their, the inner cities and what we found is that issues that are plaguing inner city residents uh, go they span across cross culturally um, so what does that look like well we have programs on financial literacy um, health and wellness, cooking programs, sexual purity programs, uh, prophecy programs, so many programs. And if you guys can copy and paste links, I know a lot of you have Facebook pages. You can share links and partake in digital evangelism. Amen. Yep. And here to my right, <laughs> yeah, my right, your left. <laughs> I have my good friend, Tim Parton. What right. do you, what's your role, Tim? My name is Tim Parton, and I am the general manager of the Praise Him Music Network, and we are a network, a video channel that exists to glorify God and encourage His people through uh, uh, um, 
music. <laughs> That's what it's called. It's music. Hello? So it's, um, it, it is, uh, right? Inspirational. And um, inspirational music. So what I, I'm excited, speechless as it would be, to, to tell you that in three days we're going to launch this network. Uh, January 2nd, Tuesday, January 2nd, we're going to launch the Praise Him Music Network. And we would love for you to be a part of this network. In the future, we will, we will need guests to sing. So if you have a, a gift, a talent in music or media, if you're a singer, songwriter, instrumentalist, an artist, uh, a poet, um, if you're a videographer or a cinematographer or graphic artist, whatever, the, whatever way you praise him, if it's a fine art, we would love to hear from you. So you can go to our Facebook page at 3ABN Praise Him. And you can also uh, follow us on Instagram at Praise Him, 3ABN Praise Him. Uh, we would love to hear from you. Over the next 24 hours, we are kind of holding a little pledge and a challenge to you to reach out to us at 3ABN Ideas at 3ABN.tv. If you have ideas, suggestions for any of the networks that uh, 3ABN hosts, we would love to hear from you, uh, uh, the ideas for programming or for special guests, artists, ideas that uh, might be relevant to your age group. Who knows what you've got? We want to hear from you, especially over the next 24 hours, because in 24 hours we're going to be giving a, a gift away, a special gift. And you can also come to us at the booth in the exhibit hall. We want to hear your ideas. So be sure and reach out to us, especially over the next 24 hours at 3ABN Ideas at 3ABN.tv. Thank you so much, Tim and Jason. It's a privilege to serve the Lord through media. And each one of you can be part of the 3ABN family. We are looking for your ideas. We're looking for your suggestions. We're looking for you to participate in the ministry of 3ABN. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Did you guys go on outreach? Who went on outreach? Raise your hand. Did you guys have a good time? Well, the, for the first time, we're going to share some stats. Two hours after outreach. Who wants to know what happened out there? Yes? Amen? Well, I'm going to share some stats after I share these three incredible testimonies. All right, and our first testimony comes from Alvina. Alvia, I'm sorry, Alvia. Alvia, where are you from? I'm from Houston. And uh, so you live here locally. You went on a bus. Was it refugee or non-refugee? Refugee. So you met somebody at the door. They were a refugee. Where were they from? Ethiopia. Okay, and what happened at this door? Okay, so originally my partner and I, my sister, walked up to uh, the door. We were getting ready to walk away when they opened the door. Um, they accepted um, to participate in the survey, and they started the survey uh, with us when we got to the question of um, his country of origin. He jokingly mentioned China. And as I was typing it in, into the survey, he was like, no, I'm just kidding. I'm from Ethiopia. And we, uh, he loosened up. You could tell that he felt a little bit more comfortable doing the survey. And we went through the questions of the kids. And then when we got to the question of uh, doing prayer together, he goes, um, okay, but who are you going to pray to? And I answered God. And he uh, goes, do you believe in Jesus Christ? And I said, yes. And he asked me, who is he to you? And I didn't really know what to reply, but what came to mind at the moment was he's my savior and he's my best friend. And Amen. to that, he, he seemed hesitant at first. And right when I said that, he smiled really big. And then he said, then yes, you can pray for me. Um, at first, he wanted to be the one to pray for us. But as soon as I replied, that to him, it seemed like he was okay with me praying for him. And so um, his son was standing next to him, and I prayed for them. Their names are Daniel and Isaac, and so we prayed together. And when we were done, he wanted to know more about the survey, and so I shared a little bit about uh, the GYC conference with them and what we were doing in town this weekend. And so he um, told us to keep sharing Jesus. He first asked when you... Um, when you go out there and do these surveys, do you tell people about Jesus? And I answered, yes, if they allow me to. And he replied the most amazing res response to me and, and 
best advice. And he goes, don't ask for permission. He goes, when you're given the chance, go for it, take advantage of it, and uh, know that it's not you doing the work, but it's God doing the work through you. And so when he said that, I really didn't know what else to say other than thank you for the advice you gave me. And as we parted ways, he... Um, oh. So, okay, so you meet this man. He's a refugee from Ethiopia. You thought that you were there to bless him, but he ends up blessing you and encouraging you. And then at the end of this experience, what did you, what did it make you feel like? So just like you said, I felt like he had preached more to me than I could have ever preached to him. And so I took his advice to heart. And although this was my second time uh, going door-to-door -door knocking, I feel more encouraged to keep doing it, to uh, step out of my comfort zone and leave my fear aside knowing that, like he said, it is God doing the work through me. And so um, he did mention uh, as we were leaving, we were like, Happy New Year. And he goes, You're welcome here anytime. Amen. And then you decided you wanted to make a commitment, since you live here in Houston, to do what? Right. So as a youth leader in my church here in Spring Branch, I decided that we're going to come back. We're going to have follow-up with the several houses we knocked on, and we're going to come back, whether it is to visit, write to them, um, deliver a food basket or some sort. We're going to have follow-up, and I made that commitment in my heart, and it's going to happen. Amen. So you decided that you're going to follow up with the, the refugee community because you've experienced what it, the encouragement that it got you received from this. Amen. Thank you for sharing. All right. Our next story comes from John, and John is from Weimar. Tell us what bus you went on. I wanted to go on a bus that would go to a place where I could talk to people who speak Chinese. So I went down the line, and I sat down in the Chinese group. All right, and then you ended up going where? Well, we ended up going to this apartment complex, and it was gated. Once we got through the gate, once the car went through, I felt impressed because I had prayed with my outreach partner. I felt impressed that we should go to the back, to the very top. There were three floors. We went all the way to the back top corner and started working forwards. So you decided you were impressed, and then you decided to go all the way to the very back third floor of the apartment complex. What happened? Who did you meet there? Well, one of the first doors that I knocked on, there was this young woman who came to the door. And I was expecting someone who spoke Chinese, maybe, maybe Hispanic, but there, she had a head covering. Uh, I'm sure you guys have seen the beautiful head coverings that Muslim women wear. Um, she, was, she was from Afghanistan. Oh, wow. Okay. And then you asked her for her name. What happened after that? She was hesitant at first when, when she first opened the door. But after a while, she, I asked her for her name. And she said, my name is Arzu. And because of, I learned a, few, a little bit of words of Middle Eastern languages growing up, I knew that it meant hope or a wish. And I mentioned that to her, and she just completely opened up. She brought her sister, she brought her mother, and we talked, and we were able to find out what they needed. It turns out that refugee families need stuff like sofas and tables because they can't bring them. They're heavy. They can't take them all the way from home. So she was hesitant at first. You said her, you knew the meaning of her name because of your past missionary experiences. And then she shared her practical needs. Did she sign up for follow-up? Um, I was hoping that she'd be interested in the Bible or maybe a glow tract, but she wasn't. Um, she didn't really want to have much to do with that, but she was willing to have us pray with her. And afterwards, we got her number, and we're going to follow up as best we can. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, John, for sharing your story. All right, and our next um, group is um, Kennedy and William. Tell us, where are you guys from? We're from Jersey. Okay, we got some plant fans out there. So tell us, um, you, it was the end of the, of the bus trip, and um, what happened? You had one thing left. So since we were pressed on time, my friend... He was already walking towards the bus stop from where we were gonna, where, from where we were gonna get picked up from, and I was already walking towards the opposite direction to the other houses that we can knock on, and uh, to the people that we can talk to. So you decided you're gonna keep going, but your your partner is already headed towards the bus. So then what happens? So I told my partner I was like, Yo, dude, come on, we just got one more. <laughs> One more Bible study God left. 
we could talk to one more person to save. Amen. Okay. And so you kept going and what happened? Did you join him or what happened? Yes, I ended up joining him back. Uh, I was like, okay, let's just get this over with. Uh, initially, that's what, initially, that's what I had in mind, but definitely I wanted to get this one last Bible study out so that one more life can be saved. Amen. And so you met a young man, and this young man, you find out, is also Christian. What happens at the door? Yeah, so when we had the discussion, we had a one-on-one -on -one discussion with the man. He said he was Baptist, and he wanted... He had religious background. He knew about the Bible. And he surprisingly, when we got into more deeper conversation, we find out that he was actually from Jersey, he initially from Jersey. He lives in Houston temporary, but his hometown is back in Perthamboy, which is surprisingly, God, praise God, because that's literally 10 minutes away from where we live. And... To just um, to wrap it all up, he actually lives on the same street as one of our fellow friends, uh, the church of Perth Amboy Church. So I decided that we should, uh, I got in contact with the youth leader of the Perth Amboy Church, and we discussed about possibly giving Bible studies, not to just the man, but to his mom, who is also living in Perth Amboy at this time. Amen. So you go to this young man's, it's your last door, he signs up for Bible studies. You find out he's also from New Jersey. And not only that, 10 minutes from your house and just down the street from the local church, you connect with the local church youth pastor, and they're going to follow up with his mom. Amen. What it, God brings us to the exact doors that we need to go to. And as promised, I need to tell you what happened with the stats. So this is what happened. We went on 32 buses. We knocked on, oh, there was 1,664 young people and chaperones that went on the outreach. We knocked on more than 11,044 doors. 3,276 of those were refugee doors. 151 refugees are interested in Bible studies. Amen? 622 Bible studies overall. Over 640 people donated items four refugees, and over 19,650 glow tracks were passed out. Amen. Can we get an amen? amen? All right. Thank you so much.
Go and tell the children they are precious in His sight. Carry the light, and I'll carry the light. Carry the light. Go and preach the gospel till there is no more night. In the name of Jesus Christ. do that again. Good evening. evening. It's wonderful to have the privilege and opportunity to speak with you again. Let us bow our heads together. Loving Father, we are grateful for the privilege of life, health, and strength, and for the opportunity to dig into your word. I pray that you would jolt your people tonight. I pray, dear Father, that hearts and minds might be open to looking at things a different way. And I pray that you would help us to begin to understand your thoughts are not our thoughts, your ways are not our ways, for as high as the heavens are from the earth, so are your thoughts from our thoughts and your ways from our ways. We give you praise in advance for what we trust you can do for us. In Jesus' name, amen. The theme of GYC is to the end. I believe, as I shared with you on last night, that we cannot reach the ends of the earth until we first reach the end of ourselves. Beloved, one of our biggest obstacles is our thinking. It's our what? In Isaiah chapter 55, verse 7, the Bible says, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Verse 8, for my thoughts are not, neither are your ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than, and my thoughts than your thoughts. I want to suggest to you tonight that we need a radical change in the way we think. It's not radical because it's new. What we'll talk about tonight is biblical. It is radical in the sense that we've not done it. 
I want to start by sharing the examples of three luminaries in Scripture. Of course, no one shines brighter than Jesus, but these individuals are most certainly scriptural luminaries. The first one is Moses. Everybody's familiar with Moses. Moses was unique because Moses understood from the time he was a child that God had a purpose for his life. Isn't that an amazing thing to know from the time that you're a little child? That God has a purpose for your life? But what Moses knew went even further than that. He didn't just know that God had a purpose for his life, he knew the specific purpose, the reason behind his birth and how God would use him. Moses was taught at his mother's knee that God would use him to be the deliverer of Israel. He would lead them out of Egyptian bondage into the promised land, the place that had been promised to their ancestors. Moses knew this from the time that he was a child. Along the way, Moses hit a bump in the road. He thought, he what? He thought that he would fulfill the purpose that God had for him by exercising his strength. So one day he sees an Egyptian taskmaster abusing cruelly one of his Hebrew brethren, and the Bible says that he laid hands on him. These were not holy hands. He laid hands on him and he killed the Egyptian and buried him, only to discover that his Hebrew brethren and sisters did not appreciate his vision of deliverance. And so Moses, of course, goes into the wilderness, but ultimately God reaches him there from a burning bush that draws him closer into the very presence of God himself, and God reacclimates Moses. He, he retrained Moses, and now he sets him off to fulfill his purpose. Moses' life is a unique life because Moses understood his purpose. God is going to use me to deliver his people, and God is going to use me to bring his people into the promised land. But Moses' life is also unique, beloved, because Moses did not take God's people into the promised land. We all know the story. It's interesting, one time in 40 years, the Bible records Moses' sin, dealing with the murmuring and complaining, and he messed up God's beautiful picture, uh, his salvific picture. He destroyed it by not speaking to the rock, but smiting the rock, and God tells Moses, you will not go over into the promised land. Imagine with me tonight, knowing from the time that you're a child that God has called you into existence for this purpose only, and then to hear that same God say, you will not, you cannot do it. Moses speaks to God, and he's pleading his case, and God says to him, do not speak to me of it again. God tells Moses, it's, it's time for you to lay down. Time for you to lay down your sword and shield. Time for you to study war no more. And so you need to make your way to the top of Nebo. And, and Moses does that. While he's there, he has a, and this is Patriarchs and Prophets, page 475. God is showing him essentially the history of humanity and the history specifically of his people to the crucifixion of Christ, down to the spreading of the gospel, on down to the end of time. Moses looks over and sees the physical promised land, but then God shows him something else. The darkness of hopeless despair seemed to enshroud the world 
But he looked again, this is Moses, and beheld him, speaking of Jesus' resurrection, coming forth a conqueror and ascending to heaven, listen to me tonight, escorted by adoring angels and leading a multitude of captives. He saw the shining gates open to receive him and the host of heaven with songs of triumph welcoming their commander. And it was there revealed, listen, it was there revealed to him that he himself would be one who should attend the Savior and open to him the everlasting gates. I want to tell you tonight that Moses had a vision for his life and he understood what his purpose was supposed to be. But listen to me, friends. God's ultimate purpose for Moses' life far surpassed his own visions for his life. Moses didn't make it into the earthly promised land, but I think we can praise God tonight that he made it into the heavenly Canaan. And not just that, but he had privilege of swinging open the pearly gates and welcoming Jesus in as a are you listening to me tonight disappointment was turned into rejoicing that's Moses the other story I'd like to share with you is one you are also familiar with it's the story of David in 2 Samuel chapter 7, I'm not talking about his entire story, but in 2 Samuel chapter 7, the Bible paints a picture of, of David going uh, about in his palace, and apparently he comes to either one of the windows or terraces, and he looks out and he sees the sanctuary in a tent. And David says, uh-uh, mm-mm, th th this is not right. It ain't right. And David has a vision birthed in him. I don't know if it was birthed on that particular day or night, but a vision is birthed that God should have a house that is unrivaled, unmatched in all the world. It should surpass all the houses of the other gods in splendor and beauty because after all, it is the house of the God of the universe, the only true God. David calls the prophet Nathan and says, listen, I've had a vision, and it's unsettled me that God is dwelling underneath a tent while I'm living in a palace of cedar. I'm going to build God a house. The prophet Nathan responds to David and says, all that is in your heart, do it. And he leaves, and I imagine that David goes to bed that night dreaming of the splendor, the magnificence, the beauty of God's house. God interrupts Nathan's sleep that night and says, I want you to go back and speak to David. Nathan comes back to David. I don't know if it was the next day, the next week. I don't know what the chronology is, but the prophet Nathan comes in to see David and says, and this is amazing. God, speaking through Nathan, says, since I brought Israel up out of Egypt and settled them in this land, no one has ever suggested building me a house. David, you are on hallowed ground. David, you're in a unique place because you have thought of me in a way that no one else has since I have delivered my people out of Egypt. David, I want to tell you, I'm really feeling this thing about this house. But I've got some bad news, David. You are not going to build me a house. Say, say, say what? But you just said yesterday or last week that all that was in my heart, David, you will not build God's house. Can you imagine? It must have been devastating. God says it's a good plan. In fact, it's an excellent plan, and it's going to happen, but you won't be the one to accomplish it. 
I imagine that as Nathan continues to speak, David's head drops and his, his shoulders slink and he, he's, he's slumping down in his throne thinking to himself, why? Why? But something catches his ear as the prophet Nathan continues to speak and he says, David, you have wanted to build me a house, but I will make you a house. Woo! Y'all didn't hear me tonight. You wanted to build a house for me, but David, <laughs> because as we used to sing in, in, in the church I grew up in, you can't beat God giving. No matter how hard you try, because the more you give, anybody know that song? The more he, the more he gives to you. So God says, David, you have decided to build me a house, but I'm going to make you a house. What does that mean, God? It means that you will become the receptacle of my son. He's going to come through your family line. The Messiah will be a part of your family, David. David breaks down. It's, it's beautiful if you've never read it. Go home tonight or to your hotel room or wherever you're staying and open up 2 Samuel chapter 7 and you will find David is not devastated. He's not disappointed. He is humbled. Who am I? David says. Who am I? I was just tending the sheep and you went and you called me and you anointed me and exalted me to be king over all of your people. But now this too, David had a vision for himself when he was anointed as king, I imagine, and he had an even greater vision of building God a house, but he was not disappointed. Why? Because God's vision for David surpassed his vision for himself. Are you with me tonight? The third person I want to talk to you about is Elijah. <laughs> this, this, this brother is amazing. Elijah comes out of nowhere, comes into the palace, and the, the implications or the inferences are that Elijah had spent much time in prayer sighing and crying for the abominations that had been done in the land, and a burden developed in his heart and in his mind. He wanted to see the people of God experience repentance. He wanted to see idolatry kicked out of the land of Israel. He wanted to see the people's hearts turned away from the false worship of Baal back to the worship of the true God, Jehovah. Elijah dedicates himself to this, and the Bible tells us that he appears on the scene and says, there will be neither dew nor rain except at my word. And then immediately he disappears and there is a manhunt, a nationwide manhunt for him. He spends about a year and a half by the brook Kerith and then he spends the rest of the famine there with the widow at Zarephath. And Elijah has dedicated himself. Elijah has sacrificed to see God's people turn back to him. You know the story. At the appointed time, he goes and he tells Ahab to gather everyone there at Mount Carmel. Fire comes down from God out of heaven. All of Israel, can you imagine the scene, beloved? Thousands upon thousands of voices, that, and this has never been heard in Elijah's lifetime. Thousands of, of Upon thousands of voices, the Lord, He is the God, the Lord, He is the God. It must have made the hair on Elijah's back stand up. All of Baal's prophets and priests are destroyed. Elijah goes up and he prays. Seven times he's on his knees. And he sees a dark cloud, small, the size of a man's hand, or the, his servant sees it and comes back and tells him, and Elijah gets up and begins to run. He runs before Ahab's chariot, supernaturally endowed. He runs before Elijah's, or excuse me, before Ahab's chariot down to the city of Jezreel, and he falls down exhausted. And then Jezebel's servant 
comes and whispers the news, her response to all that had taken place. And Elijah begins to run again into the wilderness towards the mountain of God. Elijah's life had been dedicated to reform, to revival and reformation. And Elijah is devastated. It appears to learn that after all that has transpired, there are still some who would resist the power of God. I want to share with you tonight, Elijah never fully saw the nation of Israel turn in repentance to God. But Elijah's story, I don't think anybody in here tonight feels sorry for Elijah, do you? Because you know where he is, right? The Bible says that God sent, <laughs> he sent fiery chariots to come down and translate him to heaven without seeing death. And Elijah is granted the privilege along with Moses. Whoo, help me, Lord. He is granted the privilege of coming down to encourage Jesus. Oh, how would you like that privilege tonight? To encourage Jesus. It's, it's going to be all right, Jesus. It's going to be all right. We believe in you. You're going to make it. We've been waiting on this. All of humanity and all of nature has been waiting on this. You're going to do it. It's going to be all right, Jesus. Elijah wanted to see revival and reformation in his lifetime, and he didn't see it. But God took him to heaven because God's vision for Elijah was higher than Elijah's vision for himself. In the book Education, page 18, and it's been such a long time, almost 17 years or what have you with GYC. I think this used to be one of the things folks used to talk about at GYC higher than the highest human thought can reach. Higher than the highest human thought can reach is God's ideal for his children. Godliness, God-likeness is the goal to be reached. I want to remind you, beloved, of these three individuals and tell you that what God designed for these individuals was better than what they imagined for themselves. <laughs> Help us, Lord. Here's our question. What do we imagine for ourselves? I'm going to go out on a limb tonight, and I'm going to say that there are at least two things that we imagine for ourselves. Just know this, I'm not here to make you feel good tonight. I'm here to challenge you to think. There are at least two things that we envision, that we desire for ourselves, especially this crowd. You want to know what they are? You already know what they are. Number one, soul winning. What's number one? That's what the testimonies were about. That's what GYC is all about. But the other one is closely related. Soul winning and to stop sinning. Now just stick your toes under your seats because I'm about to step on them. Soul winning and to stop sinning. I'm not going to deal with both of those tonight, but I'm going to deal with the stop sinning one tonight. 
And I want to suggest to you a question. What if, beloved, the way to achieve what we desire is not in fact what we think it is? Nothing wrong with the goal, but what if the way to achieve the goal is not what we think? I can't tell you how many people I've spoken to, especially young men and young women, who are wrestling with their inability to live up to God's high ideals and standards. His purposes. I can't tell you how many I've spoken to who are discouraged and feel defeated because they look at themselves and recognize that I fall miserably short. I could say more about that, but I don't have a lot of time tonight. Turn with me to Isaiah, the 58th chapter. Isaiah chapter 58 is fascinating, beloved. Verse 1 says this, cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sin. Now I gotta, I've got to admit to you, when I first read that, my expectation is that God is getting ready to go down a list of idolatrous practices, right? I mean, these are folks who need to see their sins. They need to understand their transgressions, and apparently they are blind to what's really going on. So God says, when you talk, you got to do it really loud. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Cry aloud. Don't spare anyone. Show my people their sins. Let them know what their transgressions are. But listen to this, verse 2. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching to God. Beloved, I want you to get what Isaiah chapter 58 is saying to us. These are not irreligious people. They're the type of individuals who plan on coming to GYC every year. They're the type of individuals who are the first ones in the church when the doors are open. They're the type of individuals who want revival and reformation in their lives. They're the type of people who want to be like God. And yet God says that in their religious round of practices and services, they have in fact missed the point entirely. It is these people that God says needs to see their sins and their transgressions. I'm scratching my head just like the people that this was written to. What do you mean, God? Verse 3, this erupts in their response to God. Wherefore have we fasted, say they, and you don't see? Wherefore have we afflicted our soul and you have not taken knowledge? Behold, in the day of your fast, God is responding now, you find pleasure and exact all your labors. You fast for strife and debate and to smite with the fist of wickedness. You will not fast as you do this day to make your voice to be heard on high. And then God asks a question in verse 5, is it such a fast that I have chosen? A day for a man to afflict his soul. Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Wilt thou call this a fast and an acceptable day to the Lord? God says, listen, you've laid prostrate and you've prayed and you've cried and you've prayed and you've cried and you've pled with me and you have, you have, you have fasted and you've said, Lord, I'll do whatever it takes. 
But God asked the question tonight as he did from the pen or the lips of the prophet Isaiah, is this what I really desire? God begins to explain the dilemma. Verse 6, is not this the fast that I have chosen? To loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke. Is it not to deal your bread to the hungry and that you bring the poor that are cast out to your house when you see the naked that you cover him, that you hide not yourself from your own flesh? Did you notice what the difference is? The fast that Israel was engaged in was a fast that centered around themselves. And God introduces a fast that centers on serving others. Did you get it or did you miss it this evening, beloved? Now I want you to pay attention to what God goes on to say. One fast is centered on me. Oh Lord, if I could just overcome two more sins. Lord, if I could just get rid of this besetting sin, the one that so easily besets me, and, and my prayers are consumed with me. God, help me. God, deliver me. God says, get your mind. Remember what we read in Isaiah chapter 55? It's a change in the way we. God says, get your mind off of yourself. But I want to stop sinning. Yeah, but your mind is only on you. Verse 8. <laughs> then, this is, this is when we begin to live, and, and by the way, who lived like this? Come on, beloved, who lived like this? This is the way that Jesus lived. You remember what he said when uh, someone said, hey, I want to follow you, I want to be your disciple. He said, foxes have holes and the birds have nests, but the Son of Man has? He has nowhere to lay his head. He could have certainly taken up a collection so that he could get himself a decent place to stay. But Jesus was more interested in serving others than he was in making himself comfortable. Are you listening to me tonight? Now listen to what happens in verse 8 as a result of adopting this type of selflessness. Then, then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and your health will spring forth speedily. Lord, have mercy. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord will be your reward. Have you ever considered, my dear friends, that when you're praying for your health, God might ask, why should I give you more health? You're just going to consume it on yourself like you've been doing already. But the individual who is living to bless others, listen to how this individual prays, Lord, give me more years so I can continue to glorify you by serving the men, women, and children that you have laid down your life for. The servant of the Lord, I always get this mixed up, please forgive me. She says, the law of heaven is this, to live is to give. And my dear friends, all of the universe is in harmony with this law except here on planet earth. And God says, if you get into harmony with this principle, then your light, then your light will break forth as the morning and your health will spring forth speedily. Your righteousness will go before you. The glory of the Lord will be your reward. Reward, Verse 9, listen, listen, friends. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. 
Did you hear what I just said? I've read to my children the story of Samuel, right? And I've told them as we pray, now we're going to pray like Samuel prayed. Samuel prayed, speak, Lord, for thy servant hears. But here in Isaiah chapter 58, a different picture is painted. God says, when you live in harmony with my principle, when you live in harmony with my character, when you call, I will answer. I don't know about you, but I want God on speed dial. I want to call on the Lord, and I want Him to show up every single time I call on His name. And God says, I'll do that for you if you adopt this principle, if it permeates your being. Then you will call, and the Lord shall answer. You will cry. <laughs> this is almost blasphemous, but it's not. It's biblical. Thou shalt cry, and he shall say, this is God, here I am. Whoo! That's Samuel's prayer inverted so that God is responding to faithful, loving, selfless humanity by saying, here I am. What do you want me to do for you? What do you need from me? Thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke, the putting forth of the finger and speaking vanity. If you draw out your soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light arise in obscurity. Let me just get prophetic and apocalyptic for a minute here. This is when the prophetic message that we have been gifted with and blessed with by God will go forth with speed and with power. This is when the three angels' messages will arise from a place of, of, of obscurity so that we don't have to knock on doors and people say, what church do you belong to? The Seventh-day Adventist, the Seventh-day Adventist, who? Yeah, yeah, the Seventh-day Adventist. I've never heard of that. God says when we live in harmony with this principle that is outlined here in the 58th chapter of Isaiah, then our light will rise out of obscurity. People will say, I know who you are. Then shall thy light rise in obscurity and thy darkness be as the noonday. Verse 11, and the Lord shall guide thee continually and satisfy your soul in drought. When the Spirit of God is slowly being withdrawn from the earth, those who have made this principle of selfless love and service, those who have made this their objective not separate from the person of Christ, but because it reflects perfectly who Jesus is. Those who have embraced Jesus and this same principle in their lives, when the Spirit of God is being withdrawn and there is a time of drought and a famine, God promises you will be watered. You will be watered. God will make fat your bones, and you will be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters fail not. Oh, Lord. <laughs> I want to tell you tonight, religious exercises and spiritual exercises alone, there's a place for them are not the way to reach God's ideal for our lives, or perhaps it's not even the way for us to reach our own ideals for our lives. This is from Medical Ministry 239. Medical missionary work brings to humanity the gospel of release from suffering. It is the pioneer work of the gospel. Did y'all hear that? It is the pioneer work of the gospel. It is the gospel 
practiced. The compassion of Christ revealed. Of this work there is great need, and the world is open for it. Our country just experienced here in the United States an opioid crisis. Anybody hear about that? What about if medical ministry involved ministering to those who are addicted? Because addicts also have families who are enduring crisis in some cases on a daily basis. Now look, I love prophecy as much as the next. Daniel, Revelation, whew, man, talk about it. But if someone is suffering from an opioid crisis, don't tell me all you've got to offer is a Revelation seminar. Did you hear what I said, friends of God? Practice the gospel, don't just preach it. Reveal the compassion of Christ. Don't just tell people where he is in the heavenly sanctuary. Show them how he lives through you. Now I know when we talk about things like the 58th chapter of Isaiah, and we talk about ministry to the poor and what have you, some folks get discouraged, ah, there we go, there we go. You know, we got a special work. We're not the Salvation Army. And that sounds real nice. And it's true. We are not the Salvation Army. I'm going to share, share with you a story. I had an elder and his wife in my church, and they <laughs> were leading out in the community service department in my church. And we had a huge program where we invited the community. We were uh, doing blood pressure checks and there was health and we had a vegetarian taste thing going on and we were giving out book bags. It was just before the beginning of school. We had over 300 people who came and one of the volunteers there at this community service event was a neighbor of my elder and his wife. They had prayed for this woman to come to our evangelistic meetings, prayed for her to come to church, invited her. They had given her the flyers. They had said, just come once, you'll enjoy it. All of this, and you know she never came. But when they invited her to come and be a part of a community outreach that we were holding to be a blessing to people in the community, she showed up. They introduced me, Pastor, Pastor, this, this is our neighbor. We've been trying to get her to church for years. Came over and I greeted, we exchanged niceties, and she said this, I have so thoroughly enjoyed, and, and we were there like all day, about eight hours. She says, I have so thoroughly enjoyed myself. And this is what she said. She said, any time that you do this, I'll be here. You see, beloved, when you and I reach out to those who are underprivileged and less fortunate, it is also an opportunity to reach out to those who are privileged and fortunate and invite them to come beside us. <laughs> I hate to use this illustration, but you guys remember Jehu. Come up in my chariot. See my zeal for the Lord. That brother was crazy. I'm not suggesting that. But we, when we invite the privileged and the fortunate to come beside us and labor with us to bless and uplift humanity, they do see our zeal for the Lord. They say, man, you guys are something else. I want to be a part of this church. Self-sacrificing service, dear friends, others-centered living, which is actually Christ-centered living. Check it in Matthew chapter 25. As ye have done it unto the 
least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto self-sacrificial service, other-centered living, which is Christ-centered living, is God-pleasing. And I want to say this tonight, it is the path to godliness and God-likeness. We are never more like God than when we are self-sacrificing and when we are doing whatever it is that we're doing for the benefit of others. Oh, beloved, I hope you hear me tonight. You can go off in the wilderness and pray for three months and won't be a lick more like God than, than you will if you go down into the streets and into the highways and byways and give of yourself. The Bible says of Jesus, he went about doing what? He went about doing good. A man by the name of Victor Hugo, he's the author of a book entitled Man's Search for Meaning. It's a very interesting story. He was in a concentration camp. Can you play some? Give him some sound. Praise the Lord. He was in a concentration camp, and as he was there in the concentration camp, one of his associates, and he developed a plan for escape. It's World War II. You don't want to be in a concentration camp. You want to get out. But Victor Hugo also had medical skills, and he had been servicing and ministering to those who were sick and those who were afflicted. He had been trying.